You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Welcome to Convenience Matters. My name is Jeff Leonard. I'm with Nax, and we're here at the Nax Show. We are recording a bunch of episodes here at the Nax Show, and we're doing two things that are pretty cool. First off, this is live, and I'll prove it. Let me hear it from everybody. Second thing that's worth mentioning is our leadership profiles. When we talk to leaders, they're by far our most popular downloads. We heard you from the downloads, so we brought two of them here today. But first, let me introduce our my other co-host or (laughs) co-host. Hi, my name is John Eichberger. I'm the executive director of the Fuels Institute, and uh, this is the program where we talk about everything in the convenience world. Uh, Convenience uh, stores power your body, power your vehicle, keep you going. If you are doing anything in your day, 160 million Americans go to a convenience store every single day. And so we're here with two of the leaders of the industry to chat about what the what is going on, what their vision of the market is and where we might be heading. So let's just start off. I mean, let's just ask the basic question. We've heard all these buzzwords this week, disruption, frictionless talking about uh, without having... Uh, paying at Amazon Go, what are some of the things that you're looking at um, that might affect your business? We'll start with you, Billy. Yeah, I think the biggest thing from an industry perspective is a lot of the M&A activity that's going on right now. Uh, And I don't know how I feel about it. I don't know how we should feel about it. Uh, For the guys that are selling their businesses at 12, 13, 14 times earnings, good for them. I'm happy for them. (laughs) Uh, But I'm not sure how I feel about it. When we look at uh, those folks that are that are buying, um, are they truly opera- operationalizing the assets? Are they really trying to up their game, or is it more of a supply chain play? You know, the more assets I can build, the better. The more efficient my supply chain becomes, and good for me. Or, and the thing that bothers me more than anything else, and should concern us more than anything else, I think, is the uh, there's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines right now. Uh, most of it in the form of private equity. That's been circling around our industry for a while, been involved in our industry for some time, but really on a really small level. We're mostly an industry of, I've got some, a couple of really large companies, but it's mostly you know, two-thirds of the stores out there, as you guys know, are single-store operators. Uh, or then you have these family-owned businesses, which comprises a good portion of the chain stores that are out there. Uh, well, you've got private equity coming into play now, and those guys are looking for a quick three- to five-year flip. Uh, so they're not going to come in and enhance the brands. They're not going to come in and and, and really drive operational excellence and how you treat the guest and, and develop new innovations necessarily. They want to come in, um, operationalize it, see if they can flip the chain in, some time, uh, you know, in a matter of three to five years. So I don't know if that's good for us, but I know there's a lot of folks on the sidelines watching our industry. In the last three or four years, you guys know, I hope all of you have been to the state of the industry. You've seen some of the data from our industry. Uh, we've had tremendous fuel margins relatively compared to... Uh, history over the last three, four years. We, as an industry, have upped our game on the inside of the store, so we have more profits coming from the inside of our store. That's, been, uh, that's, 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 that's shown stability with where we are, uh, and that's why you got a lot of these folks with cheap money ready to come in and play. And so I don't know how I feel about that. That's one of the things I think is one of the biggest impacts for our industry coming up. You know, and Kevin, the thing I like about having both you guys on the program today is we have very different perspectives. A, much, mm. a fairly large company in, in a racetrack, a much smaller company in Quick Check, mm. but you also have the unique position of being the chairman of research for NAX, mm-hmm. being on the executive committee. So you have a that kind of viewpoint. Mm-hmm. What do you see as the biggest trends happening in the industry that you're concerned about? Well, I think, you know, kind of staying in the disruption um, thought process here, m- m- I guess ours would be, um, how, how is the online digital presence affecting uh, the millennials? How is it training them to think about shopping? And, um, you know, we've seen the Amazon purchase of Whole Foods, and what is that, you know, eventually going to mean to us? Uh, we're highly focused in the box of, of trying to do our food concept better to sell fresher products. Um, so when that time does come and they do try to penetrate the convenience store market, we're a little bit better prepared to, to service our a broader range of customers. And is there, as you look at food service, I know uh, Racetrack um, has, has a focus, and it's like there's no wrong way to start a day. You want to talk about uh, the breakfast opportunity, the morning opportunity. Is there more of a focus on getting people in in the morning because then you have a couple more shots at them? Is, if so, is that a focus? And has that changed from a few years ago? 
Uh, I think it's changed for us. I mean, I've been a part of our industry for 20 years now. Um, and I started on the real estate side of our business. And it used to always be about, in the late 90s, are you on the going home side or going to work side? <laughs> um, and that was precipitated by fuel sales. What are you going to do from a fuel perspective? Uh, and we traditionally, Racetrack, hasn't been, we haven't been great on the inside of the store, except for in the last 10, 12 years, we you know, had to take a firm, hard look at who we are and who we wanted to be. And we needed to be more than just a fuel retailer, which we were really, really good at way back when and have been for most of our uh, the time we've been around. So when I hear a question like that and think about kind of what our strategies are around food service, um, there's no doubt. Our industry sees most of our guests in the morning. Um, and if you go stand in one of our stores, I tell our guys all the time, you know, go stand there, go stand behind the register for an hour, one morning, and you'll see the true racetrack customer, the true convenience store customer. You know, I think a third of our customers, uh, this is an industry number, not necessarily racetrack, but I think racetrack's pretty close to it, are males uh, in their 20s making less than $34,000 a year. And so when you think about that's one in every three people walking in, how am I going to get that guy? Those guys are the ones walking in buying six hot dogs at 7 o'clock in the morning. It gives me indigestion right now. Or, hey, give me, give me the three slices of pizza so that I'm going to eat throughout the day. Um, you know, and you sit there and you watch that and think, how I, I get intuitively what I ought to be selling in my stores and looking at the different day parts and really probably overthinking that. But the reality of it is, how do I nail it in the morning? From 6 to, to 9 o'clock in the morning, make sure I have plenty of hot dogs, pizza, whatever those guys want. It may not be something I want, but make sure we have something like that for those guys to really be able to tee off that morning, morning day part. How about you, Ken? Um, <clears throat> you know, obviously, I think we're um, breakfast and lunch. We struggle with the dinner day part in our stores. Uh, we've, we have focused on trying to grow the dinner day part, but, you know, where we see the bulk of our business is in the, is in the morning and lunch. And, um, you know, we have uh, regionalized our food, so we do a lot of breakfast tacos, uh, a lot of fajita tacos at lunch, uh, with a combination of some fresh salad sandwiches, subs, and things like that as well. So definitely breakfast is a strong day part for us, though. You know, I'm fuels and we focus on fuels vehicles what? yeah it's amazing yeah, it's right crazy. um we've been here the next show and everybody i'm talking to is asking so john what's going on in the market where are we going are evs coming all the headlines we're seeing is evs are coming we got to get ready for it it's going to destroy our, our fuels business you know billy you mentioned you guys have been fuels focused for so long what do you guys see and kevin start with you where do you see the market going for that are we really entering a transition period and if we are, how do we adjust our business model to make sure that we remain relevant to this 160 million consumers who come into our stores every day? I mean, it's a great question. Um, I think it's a million dollar question, right? But um, I, it, we definitely see, you know, more, I have stores spread out throughout Texas, right? So oil state, <coughs> but I'm um, in Austin. So we have stores in Austin as well. So it's an interesting combination to be kind of in oil state, mm -hmm. but in kind of a tech town. So, you know, in Austin, Texas, you, you definitely see um, uh, more Teslas and uh, hybrids and things like that. Uh, in other parts of the state, we do not. Um, so, you know, I think it's something that's definitely going to be growing uh, over the next several <coughs> years. You know, but my gut feeling tells me, at least for us in Texas where we are, it's a long, long curve before it gets to us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're, we think, you know, fuel efficiency will be the, the thing that... that uh, we need to address in terms of uh, volume over the next several years. And, um, and again, that's why we want to build a stronger box, right? We, we right. want the foot traffic inside and less reliant on fuel if we can get there. So Billy, you guys have historically been a high volume retailer, but also in Georgia, Georgia had a major incentive for electric vehicles. And for a while, they're kind of leading the country with the exception of California and EV adoption. That credit went away. Georgia's no longer on the map of leading EVs, but what are you guys seeing? What are you guys trying to do to anticipate what the next market might look like? Yeah, I agree completely with what Kevin said. I think it's uh, in many ways probably overstated. We all are drawn to the articles that, you know, uh, whatever car manufacturer uh, announces by 2020 or 2021, all electric. And we see that and we hear that. But if you really look at the numbers, 3 million pickup trucks were sold in the United States last year. Uh, 3 million pickup trucks. Uh, more SUVs than pickup trucks were sold in the United States last year. People are loving this gas and, you know, pricing the two, 250 uh, a gallon range. And so when I look at something like that, and um, um, think about Tesla, for example. You know, a lot of people made, have made, and rightfully so, said, you know what, Tesla had 500,000, almost half a million people go plunk $1,000 down to reserve one of these new Tesla models. 
and the $35,000 uh, model, 300 mile driving range, uh, and they're having trouble producing them. Well, Chevy Bolt, I got this stat from my esteemed uh, host up here, John. <laughs> Chevy Bolt last year, same specs, missing the brand. It doesn't have the cachet. Chevy Bolt doesn't have the cachet that the Tesla Model, Model 3 has. And so they've sold, what, four or 5,000 of those with the exact same specs, same price, same driving range, that sort of thing. So that tells me it's more of a Tesla brand play than it is really this big demand for electric vehicles, which when you read the Tesla articles, man, EVs are coming. That's what people want. And eh, people want a Tesla because that's cool. Um, well, the product's there, and they're not necessarily buying it. So when you really think about how long it's going to take to get those EVs, it's going to impact us. It's absolutely going to impact our industry. Uh, it's a much longer tail than I think many are, mm -hmm. many are stating right now, though. And, and, of course, that's the way that will disrupt the fueling business, but that business could also be disrupted. And I was thinking about, I'd, I'd like to talk about how communities were affected. Both of you had stores or have stores in areas that were affected by recent hurricanes, yeah. uh, both Texas and Florida. Florida had an exodus of 20 million people. And one thing I'm thinking about with EVs is imagine if those 20 million people were all in EVs. <laughs> what you do is you take wherever they were, you move them 200 miles north, and they would be stopped until the electricity came back on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you think about some of those issues that they have to overcome. We had fueling issues. But let me, let me start with, with Kevin on this one. Uh, when you face something like a hurricane or other things that you may not anticipate normal operations, what do you as a leader do to prepare, whether it's for keeping stores open, keeping people safe, keeping fuel supply? What's the process to, to anticipate what you don't quite know is happening? Um, <clears throat> you know, I think um, great communication within your team is so important. And, um, you know, I have to give all of our, my, my team the credit for how we handle the response. Um, we had a crisis call every morning at 6 a.m., right? And uh, it was looking at, um, you know, what stores were open or closed. You know, could employees get into work or not into work? Uh, could we get fuel to the stores? Um, you know, uh, we ended up rationing fuel just because of the chaos and the lines and the temperament at the stores. How so, did you uh, manage that? How did you tell somebody that five gallons, ten gallons is enough? Um, well, uh, very carefully. <laughs> this is Texas, you remember. Especially after they, uh, you, you made sure they didn't have work uh, carrying a gun, you know, on them. Uh, but uh, no, very carefully. We 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 signed it, and and we trained our clerks, talked to our clerks. You know, the funny thing was, um, <clears throat> we had more people thank us for it, for uh, instituting some common sense into the process. Uh, because, you know, what you saw on, on TV was actually happening, the lines a mile long, and in Texas with the pickup trucks, people would pull up with barrels and just be filling barrels full of gasoline, and then you got people behind them who just, you know, want to get some fuel and get down the road. So, I mean, we had so many people go, hey, thanks for just, you know, instituting a little common sense into this. But I think just good communication, even from our suppliers. We had a lot of suppliers. <laughs> We'd get on our 6 o'clock um, crisis call, We'd get off, we'd get on a 7 o'clock call with a supplier who was doing the same thing to us. And that really helped us kind of know how to go to business that day. So, And Billy, you not, not only had stores in Florida, but in Georgia, and some of the, the uh, fuel from Georgia was being siphoned, not siphoned, but mm -hmm. used to bring down Florida. So there were two imbalances. How do you manage something like that? Yeah, it was just a tremendous impact to the supply chain overall. And that was the thing, when the customers, you know, once the hurricanes were through and people saw that things were starting to clean up, but yet, wow, well, come to the gas station, the community sort of, they don't have any fuel. This is a week later. This is two weeks later. And it really just impacted the entire supply chain all the way through. And it took some time. That's where Kevin was going. And I, I agree, absolute positive communication. I think, I think one of the things, too, that was really encouraging to me, um, and this happens after every disaster, is how our team responded uh, some of our ops and HR leaders are sitting in the back of the room. Our head of construction's right here. The way those guys, the way those teams responded, when I, you know, it just kind of hits you right here, how the teams came together, rallied around people who lost a house, or how a lot of folks from our Atlanta region um, got in a bunch of cars and drove down to Florida. I had no idea where they're going to stay. Uh, even some folks from Dallas or Louisiana, no idea where they're going to stay. Uh, but they were going down there because they knew a lot of our team members had to deal with their houses, deal with their families. They had 
And they had other issues they had to focus on. But it was really cool, and I think it was really a, a, a seminal moment for us as a company. And thankfully, this happens a lot after these things, where, mm -hmm. where the stories come out and you hear about them of our team supporting one another. And I think that, to me, was one of the coolest things. And that's how you build a culture. That's how you uh, enhance a culture. Uh, and that's one of the things that really, really I was proud of is how our teams responded to something like that after I, the fact. And I think it, one of the things that's really key about the industry, especially this time compared to previous disasters 10, 15 years ago, is the interaction you guys have with your communities already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When these things happen, you are making efforts to get back into business, to support your communities, to support those who have been displaced. That ties into a whole reputational issue for the industry. I think it ties into if fuel demand starts to peter off because of fuel efficiency or alternative options, the customer loyalty to your brand and this channel is enhanced by that type of effort. In the disaster, it's pretty easy to say, we're going to step up and, and be a leader and try to support our communities. But it's also something that you guys have been doing year-round. So what other things are you guys doing to really kind of anchor your reputation as a part of your communities so that your customers and your neighbors really value your participation in the economy? <laughs> well, I mean, let me just say, um, I'll, I'll answer that, but I will say also, you know, one thing that we saw, and Billy and I were talking about this uh, earlier, not really in relation to this morning, but, um, y you know, we had so many of the first responders in different cities that we're in, you know, contact us and was like, you know, listen, we, we need fuel or we at least need to have the assurance we can have some fuel, if, you know, if, if needed. And so we went through uh, measures and links to, to um, safeguard some fuel for, for those people. And they were so thankful for that. And, and, um, and it makes them understand that, you know, we are an important part of that community. And then to your, your uh, first question, John, I mean, we, we've been community uh, involved heavily for years, right? Mm -hmm. So we support local programs, uh, statewide programs, uh, a lot of charities, a lot of uh, uh, women's crisis centers throughout our state. And, um, and so we, we, we're firmly committed to supporting our communities, and we've done it for years, so, you know, we're, we're known for it. Yeah. Yeah, same thing. I think just a lot of times when we talk about loyalty in our industry, it has to do with your phone and an app. Uh, to me, it's far more important to focus on loyalty within two or three miles of your store. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when all the hurricanes hit in Florida, we had a team load up a bunch of pickup trucks and take a bunch of waters to a, to a, to a shelter in Lake Wells, Florida. We didn't talk about that. Uh, we got diesel fuel to a, to a hospital in Naples, Florida. Uh, a lot of trouble. A lot of hassle, particularly with everything else going on. It was just one more thing, but it was one more thing we felt like was really important. Um, and really, this is the first time we've talked about this outwardly, is me rambling on up on stage up here. <laughs> and so, you know, those are the things that, that, uh, that build loyalty far deeper and far better than right. a little button that you might have on your phone. Doing yeah. something for the sake of issuing a press release is not genuine. Right. Doing something from the heart that really ties in the community is what right. Jeff has been working on with Refresh in terms of how do we... How do we entrench our industry in the hearts of our customers, not just the minds, but in the hearts, and become that critical element going forward? So, I mean, Jeff, what are your thoughts when you hear what they're talking about? Well, absolutely. It's not just the customers. It's the employees. It's, yeah. it's when, when you know that, uh, well, geez, not only do I sell this item and this item and this item, but I just help people in need. And, and it's a pretty powerful motivator. I, I guess the challenge, and we won't belabor this too much, but... When do you brag about it, and how do you brag about it? And that's probably a discussion that could take a couple more podcasts. You know, <laughs> when 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 does it feel right to tell your story, and how much later does it feel right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to do it where it's like, hey, look at me, but it's a very good question. Um, I didn't want to drag us down a disaster path. I don't <laughs> want to. You know, what's the summary of the podcast? Oh, well, it's a disaster. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, but we have a couple of minutes. Let's just talk about the future. I mean. It, what do you see as, what do you look at as maybe something that, that could be part of your store operations? I'll, I'll start with you, Kevin, because I'm, I'm interested in, in some of the things you have stores. You have a Texas-born uh, uh, branded products, uh, Two Hot Mamas, and, and that's a salsa that's not Thank something you. else. Thanks for clarifying <laughs> that. <laughs> I, so, uh, dear, okay. if you're listening, he's not being literal. Yes, yes, Two Hot Mamas is a jar, but... Uh, <laughs> So, so that's it. And you're looking at a restaurant with a patio. You're looking at things like that. Much different yeah. than the traditional mini mart. Yeah. What, what do you see as the future? Well, I mean, I was saying it earlier. I mean, I really feel like we're trying to think about the, the box of the future. 
and how we reach a broad base of customers. And if we're moving into a world of um, online digital uh, shopping and you know potential EVs and less uh, or greater um, fuel mileage, you know how do you survive? You know what do you do? So we, we want we want a broad range of customers. We don't want just necessarily the millennials. We want the baby boomers, the millennials, the next generation coming up. So how do you create that box, that experience? Well, we think you know uh, it's fresh. Um, but you can't, you can't forget, you know, the demographic that Billy was talking about earlier. So we're trying to create that experience that accommodates all. And uh, we think it's, it's there in food for us, and so we're heavily committed to that. We have a, you know, uh, committed to a digitalization of loyalty programs and how do we reach out social media-wise. Um, so, you know, we're trying to morph that traditional box into the box of the future. Yeah, I think that's a great response. Omnichannel is a fancy word that uh, maybe some people know what it means, others don't. But you see it in other retail, um, other retail uh, verticals. Um, how do we get our product um, out there in more places? And maybe it's beyond just the traditional two acres on a corner with a 5,000 square foot store and 10 pumps out front. You know, maybe it's selling our coffee online. Maybe it's selling racetrack shirts and hats online. Maybe it's uh, having a store that doesn't have fuel pumps, you know, like Kevin's talking about with his restaurant. Um, you know, you've got some things that are pretty interesting going on around the fringes of our industry right now where some <coughs> more innovative retailers are doing a lot of that. And that's the thing to me that we, we've always gone back and said, you know what, 83% or whatever the number is of products are consumed within an hour of purchase from our store. That's great. Well, guess what? Amazon also has, I think it's fulfillment centers or mm -hmm. DCs within almost half of the United States, 20 miles uh, of almost half of the United States, they can get product to those guys in an hour or two hours. And so, you know, we're battling that from that front. Those guys are the leaders in omnichannel, getting products in, in many different ways out to the, to, the, to the customers. That's something I think our industry is probably going to have to take a, take a look at in the coming years. You know, don't lean on that whole build it and they will come, two-acre box on the corner. How do we get our products and our name and our brand out there in more ways than, than simply the, the, the traditional means that we've always uh, employed? You know, Jeff, you and I have both been at Knacks for closing in on 20 years apiece. It, it seems like it just yesterday. Good. Hey, you know what? We, Wait, have, what? we have faces for radio and podcasts, bring, right? Bring it back to me. How about? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> but we have seen a major change in the industry in the last 20 years, and, you know, Kevin, Billy, I think Nax and the industry is so fortunate to have individuals like you who are thinking about where are we going and willing to share perspective and, and dive into really tackling some of the tough issues they're facing in the industry. So in 20 years from now, hmm. whether we're all sitting here or not, <laughs> the next people who are sitting up here talking to the Nax show are talking about what started today to evolve the industry so it is still relevant and still a dominant force of economic power in the, in the economy. And I think it is you know, the leadership of the organization and those who engage with the organization really help drive that momentum so we can identify what the hurdles are so we can overcome them. And I think uh, that's a huge compliment to what you guys are doing. And we really appreciate your leadership and your support of the organization as we try to chart the path to the next generation. So John, one more thing uh, as we wrap up. Uh, we have this great name, Convenience Matters. We think it's a great name. We think it really ties into everything that relates to what our industry is. But we have two really smart guys sitting next to us, leaders in the industry. Let's see if they can help us with marketing. Start with you, <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> Convenience Matters because... Um, because it's important, I think, in everybody's life, right? I think convenience is, uh, I think we all seek convenience in some form or fashion. How about you, Billy? Uh, same thing. I think um, convenience is so critical. Uh, to John's earlier point, half the United States will shop at one of our stores today. How do we get our products to those guys in the best and most efficient way? Um, the rest of the United States will shop at our stores tomorrow. You know, we impact so many people, and to be able to reduce friction, like so many others around us are, are doing, uh, is going to be so critical for us. Convenience matters for that reason. Well, thank you both. And thank you to all of you out in the audience. Let's hear for you once again. And for, those, and for those of you tuning in, thank you very much for tuning in to Convenience Matters, and we look forward to talking to you on the next episode. You've been listening to <laughs> Convenience Matters, brought to you by Max. For more information, go to naxonline.com.